The words you least want to hear during your medical career. Dun, 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 dun. Will you swear the witness? Now, unfortunately, of course, you don't want to be this guy, you know, but um, unfortunately, probably the majority of you sitting in here will hear that at some point in time, if not all of you. Now, that's not to say that every single one of you will most likely be sued, although a good handful will. But as physicians, you're also going to be called to testify uh, for your patients. Um, you know, that is quite common. Workers' comp, I know with orthopedic surgery, you know, I mean, Dr. Scholes, you probably were testified a lot uh, on behalf of your patients and, and things of that nature. So a lot of what I'm going to say is important to listen to in that context as well. But what we're going to start off with is about just some unfortunate but yet true facts. Amazing. First one is, you cannot eliminate the possibility of getting sued. Now, a lot of people think they can, and they think they can if they just, you know, write it all down, uh, blame someone else, like the guy that Camille was talking about that wasn't even there, had nothing to do with the surgery on the patient that some colleague later operated on, and there was an unfortunate event, um, you know, I don't know what motivated that person to do it. Maybe he was, he or she was worried that they were going to get sued, so we can, you know, write it all down and stuff. What me? What me? What me? Yeah, you cannot eliminate the possibility of getting sued in this profession, and I'm, I'm sorry to be the bearer of that bad news, but it's true. Now, what you can do, Avery, is you can reduce the odds of getting sued. And next. You can greatly increase the odds of winning the case if you are sued, if you do the following. Next. All right. Next. All right. Remember the golden rule. <laughs> you know, this is going to sound so simplistic, but it's honest, honestly, it is the truth, as, as plain as I can speak it. Do one to others. And I would say this whether this was, you know, the Christian Medical Society, the Dental Society, or whatever society this is. Do one to others as you would have them do unto you. And this is because it will greatly reduce your chances of getting sued. Just like Dr. Sorrell, and that's if for no other reason. <laughs> but as Dr. Sorrell, uh, Sorrell said, you know, the eyeballs and your bottom. You know, eyeballs look at your patient and sit on your bottom while you do it. Well, the reason is, is because that's the way you'd want to be treated. Same thing with your patients. If you, have, if you treat your patients with respect, the same way you would want to be treated with respect, you can greatly reduce the chance of getting sued. Next. Don't be a martyr, but admit a mistake. This is what I was touching on earlier. Now, when I say don't be a martyr, okay, we... I say we as though I'm in medicine. I feel almost as though I have because I work with you guys, um, and your brethren, and have for the last 14 years. But people in medicine, you're in it because you want to help people. Yeah, glory, fame, whatever, money. Yeah, no, I've seen the other side of it now. <laughs> I know the reason you guys are in it. And by your very nature, you want to do better, do better, do better. In academics, what are your professors always doing? They're challenging you. Couldn't you have done this? Couldn't you have done that? Because that's how we improve the quality of healthcare, is we challenge, we question, we do it all the time. I hope you never stop doing it. But there's a difference between that process and a real mistake. So know the difference. A mistake is when the instruments don't get sterilized. Wasn't Dr. Sorrell's fault. Somebody made a mistake. And that was a mistake. Sponge count, it's a mistake. You know, operating on the wrong side of the body, it's a mistake. <laughs> that one usually can't hide. Um, oh, it's happened. Um, so, but admit it, just be honest. 
but at the same time, don't be a martyr. First name is doctor, not God. Okay, I'm not going to pound this one over y'all's head. I know you've probably, you know, as med students heard, you know, you got the God complex and all that. Okay, I'm not going to pound that over your head. But you are very intelligent or you wouldn't be sitting here. You have excelled in your life or you wouldn't be sitting here. Some of you will be going into specialties where you will be holding hearts in your hand. So, yeah, it can be easy sometimes to kind of get ahead of yourself. But remember, you're still a doctor, which means you're human. You're going to make human mistakes. And it's okay if you do, because then you get to see me. All right, next, don't blame others. Oh, my goodness, people, please, please, please heed this one. And I want, you to, I want to be very, very clear in something. In fact, I got in a little disagreement uh, with a plaintiff's attorney in a recent case that I tried a couple months ago because he brought up the conspiracy of silence to a jury about there's this conspiracy of silence among doctors, which I promptly objected to and chastised him. And fortunately, the judge agreed, but it was very offensive to me, which is why I had a very visceral reaction to it because I hear this a lot, and it's not true. And I'm not telling you on not blaming others that, to perpetuate some kind of mythical conspiracy of silence. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about on don't blame others is don't start doing this number to everybody around you because I guarantee you it will increase significantly your chances of getting sued. Significantly. Um, you know, example, when we have a lawsuit, and we have multiple defendants, multiple doctors, or hospitals and, and whatnot. One plaintiff, whether it be a family of a deceased or whether it be an injured person, there's one plaintiff. They've got one goal. And what's that goal? To prove that someone caused harm. Someone committed malpractice. Now, if there are multiple people in the record saying, well, so-and-so didn't do something, I wouldn't have done it this way. Advise Dr. So-and-so. I think the better way to do so-and-so, you know, if you start pointing all these fingers like this, guess what? You're all going to get swept up, swept up in the fisherman's net. And when you do, you're going to have to stand by your record. And so they're going to ask you, well, didn't you think Dr. So-and-so should have done it? Well, you know, you wrote it down. You're going to have to answer for it. If everybody starts pointing fingers, what does a plaintiff's attorney have to do? Just kick back. Because someone's at fault, <laughs> obviously. You know, everybody's arguing amongst themselves, so somebody must be at fault. So you're making, you're perpetuating this litigious mindset, this, um, you know, okay, everybody messed up. And it may be that nobody messed up at all. Every single one of you, when you get out and practice, every single one of you are going to do something different. The same, one thing, everybody's going to take an H&P differently. Everybody is going to have a different type of surgical technique than someone else, maybe a little bit different, certain preferences. That doesn't mean that someone else is doing it wrong. That means that that is their judgment and then you have your judgment. So don't go around blaming others. I promise you it'll come back to haunt you. All right. Next thing that you can do to increase your odds of winning if you're sued. <laughs> Listen to your attorney. Enough said. Go ahead. Next one. Help your attorney, guys. Help us. Help me. Help you. Um, seriously, you know, the best thing that you can do is to listen to us. I know you may think that we're full of it or we don't know what we're talking about, and, and maybe we don't, and if we don't, then okay, fine, move on to another attorney, but don't go against what your attorney's saying. Listen to your attorney. And truth be known, and I think Kamel will support me in this, is, you know, in Arkansas, and you may not stay in Arkansas, you may go out to, you know, somewhere else, some big city, Chicago or something, but, you know, in Arkansas, we're a small state, 
the number of us that do this, that defend doctors, is very small. And half of us are at the Mitchell Farm, and the other half are at the Friday Farm, <laughs> which is probably why Dr. Sorrells thought I was at the Friday Farm. There's very few of us that do this, and we do specialize in what we do. And we have done it for a long time. And before we get to the point to where our partners let us actually interact with you guys, we've done it for a long time, and we know what we're doing. So, you know, listen to your attorney, help your attorney. Um, they really do know what they're talking about most of the time. And if you don't, if you think they don't, you, they don't know what they're talking about, then say so. Okay, let's schedule an appointment, let's sit down, let's talk about it. But don't just go off Rambo and do your own thing and start looking through medical records, because guess what, it's all electronic now. Yeah, and you can tell when somebody's gone into the medical records. Not good. Listen to your attorney. Don't try to testify as your own expert. Um, you know, not to get into too much detail on this, I know we've got, I'm kind of, again, like Camille, I, you know, there's only so much time we've gotten so much information to cover, but short version is when you are sued, if you are sued, then you are to testify to who, what, when, where, sometimes how. <laughs> That's it. And the reason is, is because in Arkansas, we still are allowed the opportunity that if you so choose, you don't have to testify against yourself and give expert opinions against yourself. That's why we hire experts. Let them go to war. Let them do the battle. Let them duke it out with the plaintiff's attorney. You don't want to. I promise you, you don't. They may be the biggest jerk. They may be just stupid. It happens. Um, but believe me, you do not want to do battle with them in a deposition because they've got lots of tricks well, next, that they will use against you at your deposition. If you are not prepared for your deposition, they will use them. And we're going to go over those in just a second. Okay, what is a deposition? Okay, well, kind of. <laughs> if you actually saw this episode, yeah, no. <laughs> if you haven't seen this episode and you're just looking at the picture, yeah, it looks like this. But if you're a, a Steve Carell fan of The Office and you've seen that, yeah, it's not really like that. But you do go in and you sit down at a desk. Yes, my daughter knows what one is because that's where I always am. Um, all right, what is a deposition? Next. It is a legal proceeding. It is somewhat informal and you will get lulled into thinking, you know, that it is kind of, oh, we're just chatting and stuff. <clears throat> you no. Know. It is first and foremost a legal proceeding. Do not ever forget that. Next. You are testifying under oath. You may be sitting at a uh, conference table. You may be in the break room in your clinic. I, I've taken several depositions of physicians in break rooms in their clinics. So it is very informal environment, but yet it is a legal proceeding and they are testifying under oath and ba boom, it is conducted following court rules. And da -da. The purpose of a deposition, preserve sworn testimony for use in trial. So as laid back as you may feel and you're just kind of talking and just, you know, kind of whatever, it's never nearly as fun when you see those words on a screen this size in a courtroom come back to haunt you and you're saying things um, <laughs> that you really would not want to be saying in front of 12 jurors. Uh, you might get a little laid back. You might kind of, you know, goof around, make jokes. Yeah, jokes don't read so well on a deposition transcript when you get it back and you're talking about, you know, a situation where somebody was seriously injured. A death, a death case. You don't want... Do you know what a plaintiff's attorney is going to do? And the, believe me, they will try to get you to be joking with them and cutting up and everything's great and funny, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, they get to trial and like, and this is what you said, isn't it? Do you think that the death of Miss Smith is a funny thing, Dr. Jones? Is that humorous to you? Next. 
All right, Depositions 101. We're going to move through this pretty quickly. All right, Miss Avery, will you keep us going? All right, listen to the question. Make sure you understand the question. Oh, keep going. We're going to run through this real quick. Uh, next. Answer only the question asked. If you're asked, do you know what time it is? What's your answer supposed to be? Very good. Very good. Perfect. Yes or, or no? No, usually, unless you happen to be looking straight right here and you just glanced over there like one second before the question was asked. Or you looked at your clock. But you're not, they're not asking you to find out what time it is. They're not asking you to build a clock. They're asking, you, do you know? Do you know? Is a yes or a no question. And in fact, keep going through here. I, I kind of came up with an idea. Never guess or speculate. Next. And it's okay to not remember. And next, okay. First of all, on the it's okay not to remember and the never guess and speculate, they kind of go together. And the reason is, is as doctors, lawyers definitely have this problem, probably more than, than doctors do, but you feel as though, okay, I am a trained professional, I am educated, I am supposed to know this answer. Yeah, see, no, you're not. Not all the time. If you ask me something about what my partner Steve does and what he's going to talk to you about, taxes, I can barely spell tax. I cannot tell you anything about the federal tax code. It was all I could do to get through federal tax in law school. And I know nothing about it. I'm not even competent to do my own will. Okay? But I'm a lawyer. Same time, I don't think you're going to want, as good of an attorney as Steve is, I don't think you're going to want him representing you in a med mal trial. <laughs> And it's because, yes, we're lawyers, but we're trained, we're specialized in what we do. So it's okay to not know the answer. If I'm in a deposition and someone's asking me about the federal tax code, you, you know, I don't need to just be making stuff up. Because guess what? They're going to go and find out the real answer, and I'm going to look stupid. Same thing with guessing or speculating. Well, I think, I think we usually do. Yeah, usually does not apply in these proceedings because I guarantee you there's a reason that there's a lawsuit filed and it's because things weren't done as they usually are done. <laughs> so if you don't remember, you don't remember. Don't guess, don't speculate. Um, and we're going to say this for now. Okay, next real quick. We are running short on time. All right, plan of lawyers and dun, 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 tricks of the trade. All right, real quick, and this is one of the reasons that I'm telling you you don't want to get into an argument with plaintiff's attorney. You don't want to try to have a battle of the wits, and the reason is, next. I don't know, y'all, if y'all remember Unfrozen Caveman Lawyer, gosh, great skit from Saturday Night Live, but... Uh, <laughs> Scared of man's fire. Yeah, they have a way, plaintiff's lawyers can have a way of just kind of, you know, getting, and I, want, I shouldn't even keep saying plaintiff's lawyers. Lawyers in general, believe me, we're all like this. We have our ways. And some of, next, the tricks of the trade are, number one, sham question. These aren't questions. These are things such as, well, and as you know, propofol is a very dangerous drug, right, doctor? Okay, where's the question there? As you know, propofol is, I mean, that is a, that's a statement. So they'll ask you things like that. Next, vein Caesar question. Oh, God, this is my favorite. This one, vein Caesar. Okay, as a former chief resident and fellow in the neuro, uh, neuroradiology program, you do know that those films show a spinal stroke versus a subdural hematoma, right? You know that, right? Yeah, exactly. So don't let them trick you into, well, I mean, as, you know, a, you know, educated doctor, medical doctor who went to school for five years, I mean, you know that, right? Yeah, don't fall for it. Next. You said it, question. 
Well, I mean, when you just said that the nurses weren't paying attention, doctor, did you ever document that the patient's temperature had spiked? Wait, did I just say the nurses weren't paying attention? Yeah, listen to what you, listen to the question. Next. Have you stopped beating your wife question? Okay. Doctor, is it still your practice to engage in surgical techniques that are uh, outdated and considered highly dangerous by most of the um, leading authorities? Is that still your practice, doctor? That is the have you stopped beating your wife question. There's no good way to answer it. And you know what? You don't have to. It's not really a question. Do I have a question over here? The proper, the proper response is, I'm sorry, is there a question? I mean, that would be one, because it's not even a question. It is making a statement. You are assuming something. You can stop them and say something along the lines of, you know, I'm, I disagree with your premise. You could just say something as simple as that. I disagree with your premise. Or if you wanted to engage, which, again, we're trying not to engage, well, if they say something like that, I guarantee you someone like me is going to be objecting all over the place, and Camille knows that. <laughs> I'm going to be hopping up and, you know, all animated. But just in case you have an attorney who happens to be checking their BlackBerry at the time, excuse me, iPhone now, um, you know, and didn't hear the question, you need to be aware that these are tricks of the trade, and they do do it. And just because somebody asks you a question, you know, such as, you know, excuse me, sir, when did you stop beating your wife? I mean, what are you going to say to that? What are you going to say? I'm sorry, I have never beat my wife. It's not true. They're making a statement. They're making an assumption. Do you make it a practice to, you know, in continue to engage in these dangerous surgical techniques? Wait, I'm sorry. I don't engage in dangerous surgical techniques. See, you, 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 you're not completely without any power here. If you listen to the question, listen to the question. Next. You could have done better question. You could have ordered a CT, couldn't you? Could have ordered an MRI, couldn't you? You could have gotten a consult, couldn't you? You could have done a lot of things. You could have, I mean, you could go on and on and on. You could have a patient come into the ER with a sore throat and a cough, and could you order a CT scan? Yeah, would you? Uh, no. Is there a reason? No. You could have done a lot of things, but don't fall into this trap of you could have done better, and it's really hard in academics too, because you always could have, could have, could have. But you could have done a lot of things. Next. The impossible question. Oh, this one's great. Uh, you know, the impossible question is kind of like the could have, could have, could have. And you're going to get tripped up in this in medicine, and that is, you know, something along the lines of, you know, knowing what you know now. Wouldn't you agree that a CT scan was indicated? Well, that's not really a fair question because you don't practice medicine knowing something in advance. Patients don't come in with, you know, okay, here's what I am, you know, I'm MRSA. No, they don't. They don't come in and say, you know, I'm meningitis. Hi, how are you? You have to do a workup and you don't know and you get different pieces of information. So when someone says, knowing what we know now, wouldn't you agree? Well, no, you don't have to agree. You didn't know then what you know now. Now, these are just a few, I mean, believe me, that's the reason, unfortunately, you need people like me. Unfortunately, I'm probably going to have a lot of job security because we are trained to deal with this. And if you're actually in a deposition, if you're actually sued, you will have somebody like myself who is trained in how to do this. We will go over these things. But this is an example of why 
you don't want to go in without representation. In a deposition, you don't want to, you know, just think you can handle everything on your own, and you certainly don't want to create a situation where you end up having to face these questions. And just as a little bit of levity, as we're ending, I had an idea. If you will stand up, please. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and click it. Parting words. Um, well, we'll go ahead and finish this out real quick, real quick. Parting words. Go ahead. Just like mental compression is not like this. Click. Next. The legal profession is not like this. We are a necessary evil. You will need us at some point in time, and when you do, it's okay. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong necessarily, but you do need to listen to your attorney. You do need to heed their advice, and you really need to listen to what Kamel had to say, and maybe you won't need us. But, again, to end with a little bit of levity, I'm going to That's read out, this is actually true, y'all have probably heard this before. Um, it is an email of an actual <clears throat> examination. I'm going to be the attorney. This will be the witness. Doctor, before you performed the autopsy, did you check for a pulse? No. Did you check for blood pressure? No. Did you check for breathing? No. So then, is it possible that the patient was alive when you began the autopsy? No. How can you be so sure, doctor? Because the brain was sitting on my desk in the jar. Well, I, I see, but could the patient have still been alive nevertheless? Yes, it is possible. They could have been alive, but in practicing law. In practicing law. <laughs> thank you, guys, and thank you for... Allowing the, Avery, her goal is to be a pediatrician, and in 2028 is what we figured out. So y'all may be seeing her in 2028. Thank you very much.